Hey guys, so this lecture is going to be covering viruses. Um, viruses are very interesting little things. Um, they're not really considered alive, which is what we'll talk about in this lecture. Um, they are, however, able to transmit infection um, from person to person or from host to host and organism to organism, um, which is what also what we'll talk about in this lecture. So first off, what is a virus? What do they, uh, what do, they do? Um, how do people talk about them and things like that? Kind of how are they discovered? And it's kind of what we'll talk about in the very intro of this lecture. Well, the study of uh, viruses is called virology. Fairly easy virus, the study of right there. So virology. Um, the word virus comes from the Latin word virus, um, which means poisonous liquid in Latin. Um, they once thought that you got sick from, you know, um, inhaling bad air or drinking uh, things that were t in, um, contaminated or whatever. They didn't really know what some kind of thing, um, some sort of poison, whatever it happened to be. Um, and that's where the word virus comes from. Um, poisonous liquids, things that you would drink, drink. Um, you couldn't, they didn't know what it was, so that's where they, uh, they kind of came up with the idea. It was some sort of liquid poison um, in the drinks that was making people sick. Um, so the word virus became associated with that kind of idea. Um, and that's where we came up with the word virus. Well, anyway, um, viruses are not really considered alive. Um, we'll talk about why in just a second. Um, but they are able to transmit disease and sickness from human to human um, and from uh, other organism to other organism, host to host, and things like that. Um, viruses, however, are kind of limited in the different types of organisms that they can infect. Um, so uh, viruses... Um, they have something called a host range, which is a very important concept um, for viruses when it, um, involving transmission. So viruses are very, very, very specialized, um, um, highly evolved um, to uh, kind of a transmit in attack, cause infections in one or two species, um, or very, very, very closely related species to that. So uh, a better way to put that would be... Um, Human viruses, things like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, um, that virus causes really uh, causes is really good at causing disease in humans, um, but it cannot cause disease in any other organisms on the planet. Um, you literally could inject pure HIV virus into a, um, a chimp or a squirrel or anything like that. I mean, it wouldn't do anything at all. That virus can only impact humans, so it has something called a very narrow host range. Um, the same can be said for uh, um, viral diseases like parvo. It can only infect dogs and canines, things like coyotes and uh, foxes and stuff. So a very, very, very narrow host range. Um, you have viruses um, like rabies, which have a very broad host range. They can impact pretty much any warm-blooded mammal on the planet. Um, not all of them, but uh, most of them can get rabies. Um, very broad host range. It can tra uh, transmit easily from human um, to human or uh, not, I mean, uh, not uh, human to human by biting, but it can, um, uh, but can transmit from a, a possum to humans and things like that, or uh, squirrels to humans if you get bitten, or bats to humans and things like that. Um, that. That virus has a very large host range. It can impact a broad range of species. Um, so viruses are very kind of restricted in what they can uh, impact and who they can impact, and it's very hard for viruses to jump um, from host to host that's in a different species. So a virus that's evolved to impact humans um, would have a very difficult time impacting uh, birds or uh, squirrels or mammal, other types of mammals and things like that. And so it's like the bird flu. Um, bird flu is a, uh, highly adapted to transmit very well in birds. It transmits uh, between chickens and poultry and things like that wild birds. It kills them very well, um, but it has a very difficult time transmitting to humans. It can, um, but it does not uh, transmit to humans nearly as well as it does um, between birds. Very difficult time jumping from humans or from birds to humans, um, but a very easy time going from birds to birds. So very small host range for viruses like that. So host range um, is the concept of what different types of organisms you can infect um, and how easy it is for you to jump from those types of organisms to a different type of organism. So, okay, what is a virus? Um, well, a virus is considered an infectious, the ability to spread from one organism to another organism and set up shop, an obligate, which means it absolutely has to be intracellular, it has to be obligated inside a cell, and it's a parasite, which means it lives off of another cell. So it has uh, a thing that is uh, has the ability to transmit from host to host, and it absolutely must live off of <clears throat> the nutrients from an, or the uh, um, 
uh, the uh, ability of another cell, and it absolutely must live inside of that cell. So that's what a virus is. It's something that lives inside of another cell as a parasite, and it absolutely has to do so, and it has the ability to transmit from host to host. So the ge genetic material of a virus, the stuff inside of it, um, what makes a virus a virus, the infectious part, um, is either going to be DNA or RNA, not both. Um, and that is one of our characteristics of life there. Um, life has to have DNA and RNA, all cells do, um, anything that's living is a cell. These guys have one or the other, not both, DNA or RNA, which is why they're not considered alive. Um, the genetic material of a virus is going to enter a host, um, kind of take over the host machinery, the host cells, um, uh, ribosomes will be hijacked and things like that. Um, which will then be used to make new particles for the virus called little viri uh, called virions, little tiny virus particles. Um, those new little vi virion, those virus particles, are going to then be assembled um, inside of the host cells. So um, the host cells machinery, the host ribosomes and things like that, um, will then put together um, the new baby virions, the new uh, virus particles to make new viruses. Um, so once the new virions are produced inside of a new host cell, um, they will then leave the host cell um, to carry the genetic material of the virus from one cell to another, um, or maybe one organism to a different organism, depending on the um, route of infection or the type of infection, um, and then hijack another cell and start the infection process over. So we'll get a little more in detail into how they do this and how this works in just a second. Um, but the key up here is viruses have one or the other when it comes to genetic material, DNA or RNA, not both, um, and that they absolutely have to use another species cells um, to reproduce. That's kind of why they're not really alive. <clears throat> they also don't have the ability to make energy for themselves. They cannot make ATP. Kind of a big deal there. Um, so they can do a couple of the things. They can grow in the sense of they can kind of be put together. They can kind of respond to stimuli, chemical sensors, and things like that from the environment. But they cannot do anything else without the ho um, aid of a host cell. They can't uh, reproduce. They can't make copies of their own DNA, anything like that. So they have to have a host cell to do that. Our species, most other species on the planet that are, um, that you guys are familiar with, um, can do all the stuff that's important for life within one cell. Viruses don't have cells. They have to have some other species to do that for them, some other cell to do it. Um, so we can do all that stuff by ourselves. They cannot. We are alive. They are not. So the discovery of viruses took place in 1892. Um, Dmitry Ivanovsky is a Russian guy. Um, Russian microbiologist was looking at a uh, disease called tobacco mosaic disease. Now he actually thought that this disease was caused by a bacteria. Um, what it is is it's a um, disease that causes the uh, leaves of tobacco plants to curl up on the edge. Um, it causes them to go from a nice green color um, to kind of a kind of a kind of a shimmery uh, brown reddish color. Um, hence the name mosaic it changes the colors of them and it changes the shape. Um, eventually, the leaves will lose the ability to uh, photosynthesize, and it can kill the plant. Um, so he originally thought it was caused by a bacteria, um, and he was trying to figure out how this uh, vir this disease transmitted from organ uh, from plant to plant. So what he did was he mashed up a bunch of plant leaves, and he ran it through a filter um, that he got from Louis Pasteur. Um, and then he took some of this uh, filter filtrate and he looked at it underneath the microscope and there were no bacteria in it. He couldn't find any bacteria at all. Um, but he still tried to play around with this and figure out what was going on. Um, so he took a little bit of this filtrate um, and he scratched, uh, he took a needle and he cut some of it on a needle and then he scratched a, a brand new healthy tobacco leaf um, with this needle stuff, with the stuff on this needle, this uh, filtrate that he got from the infected plant. And lo and behold, that plant leaf became uh, infected. Um, and he figured out that there was something smaller than bacteria um, that he couldn't see um, in that filtrate that was able to pass infection from person to person or from, pl or, uh, from plant to plant. And this is kind of what got people on the idea that viruses were out there. Um, a couple of uh, more experiments later, and they actually discovered the presence of viruses. Um, 1901. 
The very first human virus was officially discovered, yellow fever. Um, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, Walter Reed, a very, very famous medical physician for the army, has a hospital named after him, was the guy that was responsible for doing that. Um, variola virus was discovered in 1906. Um, this is the virus that causes uh, smallpox. There's two of them, uh, variola major, variola minor. Um, very, very, very important virus for humans. Um, was the very first eradicated virus by vaccines in 1977. Um, in the 1933, the uh, flu um, was identified for the very first time, um, and that virus was officially um, identified and figured out what caused um, the flu. So there's no um, real scientific agreement about when or where virus viruses uh, originated. It's hard to find fossils of viruses. They're quite small. Um, there's no real um, idea of kind of where they came from um, in the scientific microbiology world. Um, they are, however, considered to be the most abundant things on the planet. Um, viruses are very small. There's millions and millions and millions of different species of them. They are found everywhere on the planet, and they do tons of different things, um, which I don't even know. And uh, I imagine scientists on the planet, um, on the across the planet, have no earthly idea on the things that they do. Um, some viruses um, are good, some viruses are bad, some of them are infectious, some of them are just kind of neutral, um, and they have uh, impacted the evolution of bacteria, humans, every other species on the planet um, throughout the courses of history. Simply by killing off tons of us, um, they infect us, they bring new diseases with us, they bring new information, um, sometimes they can cause genes to be turned off. They do such strange things to our DNA and the DNA of other organisms. Very, very odd. Um, um, in fact, when a, a female human becomes pregnant, there are uh, a bunch of viruses that are actually activated within her body um, that cause the placenta to stay bound to her body. Um, without those viruses actively becoming um, alive, or quote-unquote alive during that time, becoming active, um, the placenta will not bind effectively. So viruses play a role in uh, human birth as well, but a strange thing for viruses to, to do. Um, and without those viruses, the, um, the pregnancy will not go successfully. Um, but once again, they are obligate in intracellular parasites. Those type of viruses um, do a different, they don't cause a, um, infection in the sense of destruction of cells, disease. Um, they just are living with inside the cell, but they don't cause cellular damage in that sense. They're not going to destroy the cells, they, but they are crucial um, for human evolution. That's the kind of idea. If you destroy the cells, you um, cause severe cellular damage, you're going to be a, a, a bad virus. If you don't, it's kind of a neutral idea. So here's the size world of viruses. So down here you'll see a hemoglobin molecule. One molecule of hemoglobin, this is four different proteins put together. Um, and this is the molecule that carries uh, oxygen around within our blood. Um, it's 15 nanometers across, so very, very, very small. Um, this is one yeast cell, this big, big, big thing here, this big blue guy. Um, so one yeast cell, one eukaryotic cell. So over here we have an E. coli cell. Um, so one very common bacteria, quite large, um, and our hemoglobin molecule um, down here are proteins. So one prokaryote, one eukaryote. So viruses are not considered living cells. They are not prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So they start right around in here. Virus number one. This is going to be a megavirus. So megaviruses um, are really not that common. Uh, they don't really uh, show up that much in the sense of causing problems with people, but they are quite large. They are almost as large, if not a little bit bigger, um, than rickettsia, a species of bacteria. Um, these guys cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a couple of other diseases, um, but these guys are one of the smallest bacteria species. So the largest virus is about the same size as the smallest bacteria species. The largest bacteria is about the same size as the smallest bacteria, or the smallest bacteria is about the same size as the largest virus. Um, so down in here, pox virus. These are going to be the ones that start to cause problems with people. So pox, virus, uh, herpes simplex, rabies, HIV down in here. Um, and then you get into the very small and simple viruses like yellow fever and things like that, poliomyelitis, polio virus, very small, very simplistic viruses. These guys are very simple, uh, just a nucleus or nucleocapsid, um, a little band of DNA with a protein around it. Um, and then you get up into the more complex viruses that have a little more um, things going on, which we'll talk about in just a second. 
So this is this, the world of the uh, uh, microbial world in the size of a, a yeast cell, um, bacteria, and then very small viruses. So you can see here the largest virus is about the same size as the smallest bacteria. So the size difference between the two is very, very, very significant. Viruses versus uh, bacteria, way, way, way um, bigger than one another, or way smaller, depending on which one you want to talk about. Um, viruses have absolutely no resemblance to cells whatsoever. So viruses um, cannot make protein. That's kind of a big deal. Um, protein is what allows cells to do things. It allows them to make um, cellular machinery to uh, reproduce, to pretty much kind of uh, be a cell. Um, viruses can't do this. Um, they have to hijack um, the machinery to make proteins from host cells. They have to take over host cells' ribosomes. Um, and that's kind of what the um, idea of a living organism is here. You have to be able to kind of make your own, uh, uh, your own living uh, pr proteins, your own functional proteins. And these guys can't do that. So um, they have only the stuff inside of them that's needed to um, get inside of a host cell and take it over. Um, I really like to explain viruses as a uh, the concept of a factory. Um, so you, as a host cell, you are a uh, you're, we're going to pretend that uh, your host cell, you're the the cell that's getting invaded. You have a factory inside of your cell. Your cell has every little machine inside of it that's needed to make new copies of the cell's DNA, your DNA, new all the machinery that's needed to make new proteins, all your ribosomes and things like that. You have every single machinery. That's needed to make everything that you need to make a brand new cell with inside of your cell. You have a fully functioning factory. Well, a virus needs to make a brand new copy of itself, but it doesn't have anything at all inside of him that can do that. All he has are blueprints to run the uh, machines that are found inside of a factory. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to um, invade your cell. They're going to infect your, your cell. Um, and your cell has the uh, machinery, all the good stuff inside the factory. And the virus is going to come in, um, and essentially it's going to tear apart the um, blueprints that run your factory, your cell's DNA. It's going to tear that apart. So now what you have is your cell has a factory inside of it, but no blueprints to run the factory. No one's telling the factory what to do. And then the virus's the DNA is going to uh, come into play, um, the, or the RNA, whatever it happens to be. Um, and that is going to reprogram the factory within your cell to then make new copies of the virus. Whereas originally with your DNA, it's making new copies of your cell. Um, now when the virus inserts its DNA, your DNA is now going to be gone. The only DNA that's left is from the virus. So your original cell's machinery is now going to be reading the virus blueprints to make new copies of the virus. Um, and that's how these guys work. They hijack your cells to make all the stuff inside of them that they need, all of this good stuff that they cannot make. So let's talk about what a virus is put together with, what's on the inside, how they work, and kind of all that stuff from the outside in. So on the outside of a virus, you're going to have something called a capsid. Every single virus on the planet has a capsid. Essentially what it is is it's a little ball of protein um, that can come in a couple of different shapes, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so it's essentially just a little ball of proteins that is going to protect um, their DNA or RNA that's inside of it. And this is all a virus is. It's a little ball of protein with some DNA or RNA inside of it. Um, I like to explain these, these little ball of proteins, the capsid. It works just like a postage envelope. It does not matter what's inside the postage envelope as long as there's a stamp and an address on it. You could have an empty envelope, an envelope with $1,000 in it, which you're more than welcome to mail to my house, um, an envelope with a picture, a letter, anything at all inside of it. Um, it doesn't even matter if you have anything at all. You can mail an empty envelope. Um, as long as you have an, a stamp and an address, it is a functional letter. A virus works the same way. As long as this capsid is put together, the DNA inside doesn't even have to be there. The capsid is what's going to cause this thing to be infectious. The DNA inside is what's going to do the taking over and cause the replication of the virus, but the capsid itself is just going to do the infecting part. 
this is the quote unquote transmission uh, vessel vessel um, vehicle for the virus. Um, without the capsid, um, you're not going to be able to get from place to place. But the DNA inside um, is what's going to be the important part to have for the vi the uh, virus to be successful. Sometimes you can end up with the wrong DNA inside of you, but the right capsid. Um, so once again, as long as the virus is put together correctly, it will try to infect another cell. Um, it just not uh, may not just be able to do so if the wrong DNA is inside. This concept will come back into play later um, in the uh, bacterial genetics um, section of this uh, uh, microbiology course. So anyway, um, we have our capsid here, which is just a little ball of protein. We have our DNA or RNA on the inside, the genetic material of the virus. Um, and together, this is going to be known as the nucleocapsid. Nucleo, nuclear DNA, or nucleocapsid acid, and the capsid. Nucleocapsid. Um, that's what that's called. So anyway, um, nucleocapsids and viruses and all this stuff, you can have two different versions of a nucleocapsid. You can have a naked virus, which is what this is, or an enveloped virus. Um, a naked virus has a capsule that does not have a cell membrane around it. It's not covered in a little envelope made of phospholipids. Um, these phospholipids are acquired from the host organism's cells. I mean, we'll see how that is uh, accomplished later in this PowerPoint. Um, a, an enveloped virus, on the other hand, um, has the nucleocapsid. You can see here it says the exact same nucleocapsid as the uh, virus up here. It's just a different species of virus. Um, and they acquire a, uh, an envelope from the uh, host cells. Um, this envelope is essentially a, a little ball of phospholipids that surround the uh, nucleocapsid of the virus. And there's a trade-off between this. This is significantly easier to kill, but your immune system um, does not find it as well. This is significantly harder to kill, but your immune system is going to see it. This stands out. It's different. This is wearing a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's wearing your own um, cell membrane. Excuse me. So um, your um, immune system is less likely to pay attention to it. But it's very easy to destroy this cell cellular envelope to mess the virus up. It's very hard to destroy this capsid, but your immune system is way more likely to see it. So it's a trade-off for the different types of species, um, depending on how they're put together. So all these little tiny capsids you can see up here. Um, there's multiple uh, shapes of capsids, which we'll see in just a second. But they can, uh, you can see here they have these little different triangles and things like that, the little things, the pieces that build up um, the virus capsid itself. And those little capsid pieces are called capsimeres. Um, they're little repeating sections that uh, make up the capsid, and we'll talk about this a little more in just a second. So this is a, a different type of structure of a viruses. These concepts are also called morphologies, the shapes, once again. Um, so the, one of the structures of viruses, the uh, um, way that they're put together, the morphology, um, is called helical. And essentially what this is, is a giant toilet paper tube with DNA just wound on the inside of it. Um, so a hollow toilet paper tube, look down at and you just see a little spring coiled up on the inside of it. So it's capsimers, the little individual tic tacs are put together in a little tube, um, repeating circles, um, added on to one another, and the DNA is just wound around on the inside of that um, str of that little toilet paper tube. So helical, a um, couple of viruses that you guys uh, are familiar with. One of them is that tobacco mosaic virus um, are shaped like this. Very interesting little uh, hollow toilet paper tube with a uh, piece of DNA wound or RNA wound around on the inside of it. And the next one is icosahedral. Icosahedral is a 20-sided die. It's got a 20 corners on it. Um, little individual capsule mirrors in here, little small tic tacs make up uh, things called facets. If you know anything about how they uh, cut diamonds and things like that, it's also the side of a shape of a jewel, the side of a cut of a diamond is called a facet. Um, so individual little capsule mirrors here, the same concept here, they look like little tic tacs, and they're stacked up in a very little orderly, repeating little triangles um, that are added up into 20 sides. You got 20 little triangles that are all stacked together to make up these shapes. Um, so 20 sided, uh, 20 of these little facets that make 12 um, distinct little corners of these viruses. So this is the uh, virus envelope. Um, so almost um, only going, or you're almost only going to find um, animal viruses that have an envelope. Every single species of um, organism on the planet, including bacteria, have viruses that can infect them. 
Now, that host range concept comes into place here. Um, if you're a bacterial virus that's evolved to infect bacteria, you're not going to infect humans or any other species at all. If your organisms, viruses that have evolved to infect animals, um, this is what we're talking about here. Viruses that function only in animals. So most of these other guys, plant viruses, um, fungal viruses, bacterial viruses, they have cell walls. So it's very difficult to get a, a membrane out of these guys. So animal viruses, um, animal cells lack cell walls for the most part. Very, very, very rarely are you going to find those in, anim uh, in eukaryotes, or excuse me, in uh, animal cells. Um, so uh, this is what you're going to find uh, envelope viruses it's in animal cells. Um, they lack that cell wall, so it's very easy to kidnap their cell membrane. So um, this uh, cell membrane here, you got your nucleocapsid, um, and what's going to happen is they're going to steal a, a little ball of phospholipids from the cell membrane of the host um, when they leave the host cell. So that host cell, it's kind of a, imagine a, a rubber glove. You stick your hand in a rubber glove and you uh, push your fingers through and you push your fingers through. Eventually what's going to happen is you keep pushing, you keep pushing, pulling it down on your arm. Um, eventually what's going to happen is it's going to break and your fingers are going to have the little pieces of the, the glove left on even though the rest of the glove probably breaks away. And this is kind of the same concept of how this works. The uh, uh, little virus will get up next to the cell membrane of the uh, host animal cell, we'll talk about this a little more in a second, and they'll just push through, push through, push through, and they'll pop off eventually um, and take a little bubble of the cell membrane with them. Um, on the outside of a virus, every single virus is going to have something called spikes attached to them. Um, and these little spikes um, are how the viruses are going to attach to different parts of the cell itself. So this is how the uh, host range is influenced. These little spikes are what allow viruses to attach to different types of cells. The different types of spikes that you have, the different types of cells that you can bond to. Um, if you have a spike that only is going to attach to something that's found on liver, human liver cells, you can only bond to human liver cells. If you have spikes that, are found, that bond to something that's found on every single eukaryotic cell on the planet, you can infect every single eukaryotic cell on the planet. And that's how this works. The different combinations of spikes that you have on your, uh, the outside covering of your cell as a virus allows you to infect different types of cells, um, different types of host cells. So a virus that has a very limited host range is going to have spikes that impact only maybe one type of cell um, within the human body. So you can only impact one, let's say like hepatitis can only impact liver cells in the human, um, in humans. So it's uh, spikes can only impact one type of cell. Whereas rabies, that virus has spikes that impact um, a very generic uh, place found on eukaryotic cells, which is allows it to impact lots of different organisms. So that's what the concept of spikes do. They allow different types of uh, um, uh, viruses to impact different types of cells. So what does the capsid do? So the capsid by itself just protects the cell. It makes perfect sense. It allows the, uh, or excuse me, the um, virus, excuse me, when it, um, to have some protection for the DNA. They're not living cells. Sorry, I've said that incorrect. Um, so it gives the uh, virus a little protection for the DNA on, and RNA uh, for its, uh, its genetic material. Um, if you had raw DNA or RNA floating around in the environment, it's more than likely going to get broken down or destroyed. Um, so that little capsid gives them a little bit of protection. Um, when you're inside the host cell, as we'll talk about in just a second, the capsid's going to be shed. You'll lose the capsid. Um, the capsid works essentially, once again, like that uh, uh, envelope. Once the envelope arrives at its destination, you open the envelope up, you take out what's inside, and you throw the old envelope away. And that's essentially how that works. Once the uh, host cell is, becomes infected, the capsid's no longer needed. Um, it also helps the virus bind to the host cell, and it also helps it get inside. So what you'll see over here is our um, virus over here. Um, here's going to be its capsid um, in the inside here, um, DNA in the middle, um, and this is its cell envelope that it kidnapped from um, its old cell. So what's going to happen is the uh, cell is going to get up close to the cell, um, the, so the membrane, sorry, the virus is going to get up close to the cell over here, um, and it's going to bind the cell membrane. This envelope here um, is going to make it really easy to get inside of this virus. They're going to stick up or this inside of the cell here. Um, this viral cell membrane is going to uh, kind of bond to this cell cell membrane here um, and go inside. It makes it very easy to do so. 
Um, one of the last shape of viruses um, are something called complex or atypical viruses. Um, these guys are very interestingly shaped, and one of the very common um, forms of these guys is something called a bacteriophage. Um, these are va uh, viruses that have different uh, shaped capsids other than the two common ones, the helical and icosahedral, something's going to have other. Um, they also tend to be covered sometimes in a uh, um, big thick layer of uh, fat protein complex, as you can see with that uh, pox virus over here. Um, you can see what that is. That's that fat um, lipid complex here. Very interesting complex around them. Um, adds a little layer of protection as well. Well, anyway, um, one of the other types of bacterial complex viruses um, are things called bacteriophages, and this is a bacteriophage. This is viruses that are involved to impact only bacteria. These are not infectious to humans. There are one or two that are. For the vast majority of them only impact bacteria, hence the name bacteriophages, bacterial viruses. Um, essentially what this is, is it's an icosahedral capsid um, attached to a, a little interesting um, kind of nuclear or a little lunar lander um, set up down here. So icosahedral head, icosahedral capsid, essentially attached to a, a little um, syringe, kind of a lunar lander hybrid thing down here, which I'll talk about in just a second. So once again, here's our little shape here. Um, enveloped, uh, complex viruses, enveloped viruses, the naked, uh, non-enveloped helical icosahedral. You can see the helical icosahedral up here um, with an envelope on them, without an envelope, um, and then complex viruses. So a couple of different shapes of viruses and then what they are down here. So what's inside of a virus? Um, so viruses have genetic material. This is what they're going to use to take over your cells. Um, so you have genetic material, which are the blueprints that your cells use to run all the machinery inside of them. That's the stuff that your cell is going to use to make new proteins, to make um, new cell membranes, all the stuff that's needed to make your cell function from day to day. Viruses have their own DNA, but no factory, or their own RNA, but no factory. They cannot make their own stuff. You got the factory, but you also have your own DNA and RNA. These guys don't have DNA and R or, um, don't have a factory, but they have DNA and RNA or RNA, not both. So what's going to happen um, is they're going to get inside of your cells, um, give take over your factory, get rid of your DNA and RNA, and then use their own um, one or the other to make your cells factories make them. Um, so they're going to hijack your cells' machinery, make their own DNA and stuff. Uh, run the machinery, run the factory now, that makes new copies of the virus. So that's how they work. It's how they reproduce. They may uh, hijack your cells to make new copies of the, the, of the virus. So viruses, if you're a DNA virus, um, you can either have double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA inside of you. Um, double-stranded DNA is very easy to replicate. Um, we'll talk about this concept in just a second. You can either have circular DNA in this little, like, kind of like a plasmid concept, a little small circle, um, or linear DNA, depending on what type of virus. Different species of viruses have different circular, so, uh, some have single-stranded, some have double-stranded, some have circular single-stranded, some have linear single-stranded. It just depends on the species. Um, uh, RNA viruses um, usually have single-stranded RNA inside of them, but sometimes you can find double-stranded RNA. It's a little more uncommon, but it does exist. And sometimes you'll find um, RNA viruses which have tiny little pieces of RNA inside of them. Um, you'll find RNA viruses which have something called positive-sense RNA or negative-sense RNA. Positive-sense RNA, I kind of explained this concept as a book, um, you have to be able to read DNA in, in uh, RNA. Um, Double-stranded DNA has uh, left and right re writing on it, um, read from le left to right on one strand, and the other strand reads from right to left. Um, you have to read left to right to be able to read it correctly. Right to left is backwards. Positive sense RNA is read left to right. Very easy for the um, virus that has a positive sense RNA to hijack your cells. There's nothing that's extra for it to need to be done. Um, this type of RNA can go right into your cell's machinery, and the cells can instantly start to read it. it it's read left to right. Um, the cells can instantly start to read it. A, an RNA virus that has negative sense RNA, on the other hand, um, this has to be converted. This is backwards. This is um, RNA that's read right to left. You can't read that correctly. Um, it's read right to left, so this um, once this virus gets inside of a host cell, it then has to be converted 
from R, uh, the RNA then has to be converted from um, reading right to left, negative sense RNA, to reading left to right, positive sense RNA. So it's an extra step, a little extra work. Um, so you got to switch negative sense RNA to positive sense RNA, and then you can start making viral copies of yourself. Um, so positive sense RNA viruses are really easy to start making copies. Negative sense RNA, you got to convert it to positive sense RNA first, the right um, direction to, for the cells to read it, and then you can start making copies of yourself. So a little extra step involved there. So um, you might find a couple of extra things that are found inside of a virus, depending on more um, how more complex the virus is or how simplistic it is. Um, a little more uh, complex the virus, a little more up the evolutionary chain, quote unquote, for viruses. Um, I use the word quote unquote for virus uh, evolution. It's a very interesting concept, very highly debated on how they evolve. Um, so that's why I threw the quotes in that one. Uh, you'll also find some stuff that are inside their capsids. Um, generally, what you're going to find is just the DNA and RNA, but you also can find some enzymes inside of there that they uh, make inside of the host cells, so the host cell is going to make these enzymes for them, um, and then they're also just going to be assembled inside of the virus when the host cells put them together. So this, the virus does not make these, the host cell does, um, and then the virus is going to be uh, have assembled inside the host cell by the host cell, and the enzymes are going to be put in at that time. So you'll find occasionally some things, DNA and RNA polymerases, um, and these are the things that are going to convert that positive sense R or that negative sense RNA to positive sense RNA, or convert um, single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA and things like that. Um, you'll find replicases, which copy RNA, which will do that um, copying of single-stranded to double-stranded, double-stranded to single-stranded, things like that. Um, and you'll also find something called reverse transcriptase, which can turn DNA into RNA, or excuse me, um, RNA into DNA, switch it backwards. Um, regular transcription goes from DNA to RNA. Reverse transcriptase goes from RNA to DNA. Very interesting concept. Um, and this allows viruses to kind of embed themselves with inside the uh, uh, genome permanently. Um, they can use the uh, DNA to embed themselves um, and the RNA to uh, make new copies of themselves at the same time. Um, so they can do both at once. Very interesting concept for these. So viruses that have reverse transcriptase inside um, are a little more dangerous in that sense than viruses that don't. Um, so not every virus species is going to have these things inside. Um, different species have different things inside of them. Um, it just depends. So here's some stuff that you can find inside of viruses, the names of the diseases, um, what they look like, um, if they're DNA or RNA, um, if they're helical, things like that, the different shapes. Um, the genus, the family, um, and stuff like that as well. So let's talk about how uh, viruses replicate inside of animals. So this is animal viruses once again, not viruses that replicate in plants, not viruses that replicate in bacteria, just viruses that would replicate in a cell like ours. Um, so we'll talk about how bacterial viruses replicate in a minute. Um, it's kind of the same but slightly different. So. Um, we'll talk about it in just a second, then picture form, um, but these are the word forms if you want to look at these as well. So the very first step of viral replication is something called adsorption. So you have a virus floating around in the environment. Um, it's either going to be in the air or some, something that you drink, something that you eat. And you're going to inhale it, bring it into your body some way, shape, or form. Um, and the spikes that are found on that surface of that virus are going to then stick to these... Um, cell membrane, the receptors on the surface of your cells. So if you have spikes on the virus that are um, only going to be binding to human, vi uh, uh, human uh, liver cells, hepatitis virus, um, this virus is going to float around your entire body. It's going to ignore all of the cells that don't have human liver cell receptors on them that bind that match up to those spikes. Once it finds the correct spikes within the body on the liver cells, it will bind to it. This is the concept of adsorption. The virus is going to stick to your cells, um, a host cell using its spikes that correspond to the matching receptors on the outside of the host cell. That is step number one, adsorption. So step number two is penetration. You got to get inside the host cell to be able to infect it to do your thing. So what's going to happen? Um, is the cell is going to bring inside of itself 
um, the uh, virus. Once the spikes are bound to the receptors on the outside of the surface, this is going to trigger phagocytosis or endocytosis. Um, this cell, the, your host cell is going to eat the virus and going to bring it into its cell. So the spikes are bound. Your cell membrane will then start to elongate and phagocytize, eat the virus, and bring it inside of your cell. So this is penetration. It's penetrated your cell. It's now inside of your cell. Now this cell membrane around here, this envelope, um, your body doesn't know that it's a virus. Your cell membrane uh, thinks that it's cell membrane. It doesn't know that it's an infectious virus. It just sees cell membrane, which is why it brings it inside. The next one, the next step, step three, is going to be uncoating. You have to bring the virus capsid, the DNA, and all of that stuff out of the um, capsid itself, out of the cell envelope, to let it do its thing. You got to get the DNA out of the envelope. You have to have the letter to have the message. So once again, the envelope itself does not matter. You just want the stuff inside. So this is just the letter. Um, this is the envelope with the uh, um, letter on the out, with the stamp on it, with the address. The stuff inside is all that matters. So you could literally have a blank uh, capsid here, an empty capsid. This process will still occur. It will go to here, but there's just nothing inside for it to release. Well, anyway, um, so a successful virus, if there is something inside, once it's uh, released, once it's uncoated, um, the DNA will then be, or, or, or RNA, will then be released from the capsid in the inside of the cell, um, and then it can start to do its thing. So the enzymes that are going to be found inside of this bacteria are going to um, hijack the cell, going to uh, take over, reprogram the cell's machinery, um, destroy the old cell DNA, get rid of it, um, hijack the cell's proteins and ribosomes and stuff to start making new virus machinery. And this is step number four, synthesis. You're going to see the virus DNA or RNA, whatever it happens to be. Um, new copies of that are going to be made um, inside of the host cell. Um, new spikes are going to be made. New capsomers are going to be made. All the different little pieces that are needed to make the virus put together um, at, eventually later on are going to be synthesized and made by the original host cell's machinery. Step number five is assembly. All the little tiny pieces are going to be put together um, up near the outside of the cell. So they're going to be assembled. Um, the capsomer is going to be put together in the correct order. If you have um, RNA transcriptase or DNA transcriptase or reverse transcriptase, or polymerase, whatever it happens to be, any of the little enzymes inside of you, they're going to be added there as well. Um, the spikes are going to be stuck inside the cell membrane of the host cell. Um, getting ready to be um, released and getting getting ready to be taken over by the virus cell. So then the last step is going to be step number six, or release. It's the envelope virus, you guys can see here, it's going to get up real close to the cell membrane and it's going to start pushing its way through. And eventually as it pushes its way through, the exact opposite concept is here is going to happen. It's going to push through, push through, and eventually what's going to happen is a little bubble is going to form around it um, and it's going to pop through and take a little bubble of the cell membrane, a little uh, ball of cell membrane with all the spikes that it just made inside of the host cell um, with it. So now this little baby virus is fully formed. Um, he has all the spikes around him that he needs to go up here and start this process over. So he just left the host cell. He's going to move into the body, um, and now he can either be an exhaled, coughed out, or whatever, or he can just go to the next liver cell over and start this entire process over again. So this is how the virus is inside of humans um, and pretty much other uh, every other warm-blooded animal on the planet replicates. Um, if you don't have an envelope, um, this part concept is the same except the envelope uh, is just removed. Um, so the virus capsid is just brought inside. Um, so um, concept of host range comes into play here with those different types of spikes, um, the different types of receptors that are found on the host cells. Um, bind to the different types of spikes. So if you have the wrong receptors, the spikes won't be able um, to bind to you. So viruses are very, very, very difficult to deal with in the sense of treating them. One of the ways that you can prevent a viral infection, you can't cure a viral infection um, in the sense of you can't get kill them. Um, you can just stop them from being able to be detected. 
And one of the ways that you can prevent them from being able to cause infection in the first place, though, is to block the receptors. So if you can put something inside of this little receptor spot here, um, this is ca viral capsids or spikes cannot be able to bind to them. So if you hear people say, uh, take zinc cough drops and things for the cold, and this is how zinc works. It blocks these receptors. So it will get in there and, and block the receptors so the viruses can't bond to the cells. And if the viruses cannot bond to the cells, um, the infection cannot be uh, started. They cannot be absorbed and brought inside of the cell. Um, so no bonding, um, block the receptors. I mean, that's a good way um, to prevent the infection from the get-go. So host set range, um, the different types of receptors found on the surface is what influences host range. If you have a receptors that are found, um, or host range spikes that are found on a broad variety of cells, you can infect a broad variety of organisms. If you have spikes that are found on a small variety of organisms, then you can only infect a small variety of things. So um, how do you get out or in um, to a, a cell? So there's two ways to do this, endocytosis or fusion. So endocytosis, um, you can either be brought into the cell. Um, this is that um, concept that I just talked about with the envelope viruses. They're going to bond directly um, to the cell's envelope and be just brought inside. They're going to be phagocytized, brought inside, um, and just brought in. Um, you can. This is the phagocytosis down here um, as well. Um, and then you can just be... Um, unpenetrated through the cell can literally just bring the DNA inside. So there's a bunch of different ways for viruses to get inside of cells. Um, it just kind of depends on the species of viruses. So how do we get out? Well, there's two different ways to get out of a cell. One of them is budding um, and one of them is lysis. Budding is a little less likely to kill the cell instantly while lysis does. Um, so if you're an enveloped virus, the, you have to get your envelope. And this is how they do that. Um, they're going to bring the capsid, uh, um, up, all the little capsid pieces, all their fully fo uh, formed DNA and or RNA up to the side of the host cell membrane. You can see that here. Um, the spikes are going to be added, getting ready to be assembled. Everything's going to try to um, kind of be put together in the right order. Um, starts to be assembled. And what's going to happen is it's going to be pushed through the cell membrane. You can see that here. Um, the spikes are added already. Um, it's going to be pushed through. It's going to be pushed through, and eventually it's going to pinch off. Um, and now you're going to have an infectious virus um, that's released from the vi uh, released from the host cell with a uh, coating of the uh, host cell's membrane around it. Since it is the same membrane that the host cell originally had, the immune system just sees it as the host cell. It's not really aware of its presence. So up here you can see the host uh, cell. You can see the viruses inside of the host cell. This is the endoplasmic reticulum here, the nucleus with the DNA inside. Um, you can see the viruses inside migrating up to the cell wall here, cell, or excuse me, to the cell membrane. And then up here you can see one budding off with this viral DNA inside. You can see one here um, getting ready to bud off with the DNA inside there of the virus. Um, and then lysis. Um, if you don't have an envelope, you don't need to get an envelope, you can just pop the cell. Um, and that's pretty easy. Um, you can, uh, the, if you don't need to get a virus, uh, an envelope, you don't, if you're not, uh, if you're a virus species that does not have an envelope, um, these guys, what they're going to do is they're just going to bust the cell. Um, they'll wait until there's 50 or 60 um, of vi little viruses fully formed inside of the cell. There's too much um, virus inside of the cell. It's kind of like the overfilling a water balloon. Um, and then the cell will just pop um, and all the little viruses will be released. We'll talk about that a little more in a, just a second. Um, so, sometimes viruses don't directly kill the cells, um, or maybe the virus infection lasted maybe a couple of days, um, but it caused damage to the cells that are, are, is left behind, even though the cells, uh, the virus is, itself is gone. So sometimes you can look at cells um, and see what type of damage is done to them and determine what type of virus that they had, um, that the patient had, um, or what type of virus um, infected that particular cell. So, so um, even though viruses uh, might kill the cells by lysing um, or budding out and things like that, they can also cause changes in DNA, changes in the uh, proteins and stuff like that um, when they do their, stu their, uh, their deal on the inside of the cells. So you can look at that um, and figure out the uh, damage that's been done to them. 
um, and help figure out what type of infection that this person had. And those things are called cytopathic effects. Cyto meaning cell, uh, damage, diamond, damage to the cells, and effects caused by viruses. So one of them is just changes in size and shape. You look at a normal cell underneath the microscope, you see what it's supposed to look like, and you see cells that don't look like that anymore. You see how big this cell is here? You see cells with bunches of nuclei inside of them that are all fused together. They just don't look normal. So um, this cell has been infected by a virus. You can see here this one's super dense. Um, it just doesn't look right. So this cell has been infected by a virus, which has messed up. Its proteins messed up the ability for that cell to function. Um, which has caused uh, cytopathic effects, which has caused negative effects to this particular uh, cell, which has caused a, a disease in this, this patient. You can have inclusions within the cytoplasm, um, so buildups of uh, um, viral particles or damaged uh, cell goods and things like that just build up inside of the cell. Um, waste products and things like that, not good as well. Um, can cause damage to the cell or maybe cause that cell to lose some function as well. And inclusion bodies and things like that. Um, you can cause the cells to glue together over here. You can have multinucleo uh, cells show up and things like that. Um, this messes up the function of the cell, the reproductive abilities and things like that. Um, you can have the cells just die. That would be bad. Explode the cells. That's how the uh, viruses get out, kills them. Um, if you have a bunch of cells die, obviously uh, within the liver, if that's where they're, they're killing off the cells, your liver would have some um, damage left to it or your kidneys or whatever. Um, and that can cause some damage to the human um, or the host overall. Um, it can screw up the DNA. It can cause uh, uh, cancer to form and things like that. Um, it can mess up the ability for the cells to uh, reproduce the, um, or to um, uh, replicate their DNA correctly and things like that. Um, and then the one that's probably the biggest uh, impact to humans is they can transform um, cells um, from normal functioning, um, reproducing on a nice um, meiotic clock cells, um, to cancerous cells that have no control over their meiotic clock anymore. Um, they can't control how they uh, um, reproduce the, or their uh, cell reproductive uh, cell clock rates anymore. Um, so persistent versus latent. Um, we'll talk about this a little more in the uh, um, lecture about um, how diseases work. Um, but persistent infections um, are diseases that show up um, where um, viruses are, tend to be enveloped um, where the cells show up, the cells uh, are infected, the cells uh, carry the virus for a little while, um, the viruses will bud out, um, the cell isn't immediately lysed and or killed. If the cell was killed, it would cause some damage to the host. Um, so very, very minor infection. Um, it just stays around for a really, really, really long time. Um, it can last for your entire life. Or it can come back from time to time. Things like herpes and stuff like that, or things like the measles, um, can stay hidden for a really long time um, because they don't kill your cells, they don't cause any significant damage, um, and they can just stay kind of hidden within your body for a really, really, really long time because they're not really causing immediate damage. They're not going to instantly kill your cells. So um, occasionally what can happen um, is when... Viruses enter your cells, they can mess up DNA, and we'll talk about this concept more um, with transformation um, when we're talking about viral uh, or gene genetics in bacteria, bacterial genetics. Um, but transformation is the concept or the idea of changing the DNA inside of an organism. Um, and when a virus is responsible for this transformation, um, it's permanently going to change the DNA of uh, the original host cell. And sometimes when it does that, um, it can result in cancer. Um, so transformation, um, cells that have been transformed um, that uh, lose their ability to divide correctly. They can't control how quickly they divide anymore. Um, they just instantaneously start dividing. They divide when they're not supposed to. They divide all the time, just kind of um, indefinitely over and over and over and over and over again. And uncontrolled cell growth, just unchecked, just in, in constant division, um, results in the formation of tumors throughout the body. Now, viruses can cause this to happen. Um, and viruses that can cause this to happen are called oncoviruses. Onco meaning cancer, um, cancer and causing viruses. Um, so human papillomavirus, uh, HPV, um, cer causes cervical cancer. It can cause the cells inside of a, a female cervix to lose their ability to regulate cell cycle reproduction um, and just go kind of crazy um, and cause cervical cancer. 
Epstein Var Bar virus, the virus that causes um, uh, mono, um, can cause Burkitt's lymphoma. It's the same kind of concept. It causes um, lymph node cells to uh, lose control of their uh, ability to regulate uh, cellular reproduction. So the cells just start to divide like crazy, um, which results in the formation of a tumor. So let's go ahead and talk about how um, bacterial viruses reproduce. It's slightly different. Um, concept is kind of the same, um, but these guys don't have that concept of uncoding. They don't have an envelope um, that's not going to be in, um, in, uh, brought inside the cell. They don't have to bring inside the capsid. Um, they're going to inject their DNA into the cell. Um, so that's kind of a different step here. Pretty similar, but a little different. Um, now, when these guys um, impact cells, they can re uh, get out of a cell by two different ways, something called the lytic cycle or something called the lysogenic cycle. And we'll talk about this in a, in a second. This is a very interesting concept. Now, this is the stage of bacterial virus reproduction. Reproduction in bacterials, uh, bacteriophages, so steps in phage reproduction. So the very first one is adsorption. So over here, um, adsorption, once again, you've got to get the DNA inside of the cell. I don't have it. Yeah, I do. So here's how this works. Um, so the little uh, bacteriophage is the capsid up here in the top, um, and the little lunar lander legs down here at the bottom. So if you've ever used a lancet in class, or you've maybe used one at the doctor's office, it's a little single-use needle. It's got a little spring that's inside of it with a little needle in the middle. Um, and you push the little button on the top, and the little needle fires through the little spring set off. It fires the needle down through the uh, bottom of the lancet into your finger, um, which pricks your finger, and that's how they take your blood at the doctor's office. This is a lancet. It's essentially how this works. So um, a bacteriophage is a capsid on top of a lancet, and that's how that works, or a hypodermic needle if you like. Um, so the little lunar lander legs, they sit up and um, rigid. And then when the little bacteriophage virus uh, lands on the side of a bacterial cell wall, it lands um, where it needs to go. You can see down here, this is an E. coli cell that's been infected with tons of little uh, bacteriophages. They're all over it. Um, the little lunar lander legs, once they um, go rigid, they're pushed up into place, it triggers the little um, lancet to be fired. So the spring is depressed. Um, once the spring is depressed, it fires the needle, which you guys can see down here, um, that's through the cell wall of the bacteria. Once the little needle is penetrated through the cell wall of the bacteria, um, the viral head then compresses, which squeezes the DNA or RNA of the virus into the cell wall of the bacteria, through the cell wall into the cytoplasm of the bacteria. So now this little capsid um, this little uh, bacterial cell, uh, bacteriophage capsid is useless. This is no longer um, important anymore. It will just uh, stay either stuck to the cell wall of the bacteria, just let go, and then float back off into the environment. So once the cytoplasm is, uh, uh, once the uh, DNA is released into the cytoplasm, this is where we'll go ahead and take over here. So one, you've, um, you've absorbed the cell, you've stuck to it. Um, you've now, uh, step two is you've penetrated the bacterial cell. So this is one of the key differences here between bacterial cell replication and uh, virals and, and animal cell replication is the uh, host cell of the virus's DNA, um, the DNA of the bacteria is going to be destroyed. Um, doesn't always happen in host cells for animals, not all the time, but sometimes not always. Um, but in bacterial cells, you're going to destroy the DNA here. So the virus DNA is going to be injected. Um, I just went over how that process works, like a, a hypodermic needle. So the viral DNA will be injected inside of the bacteria. Um, the little bacteriophage is also going to contain some enzymes which will destroy the bacterial DNA. So what's going to happen um, is the bacterial DNA will be destroyed, it will be gotten rid of, um, and the um, bacterial uh, machinery, the cellular machinery um, inside of it will also start making new copies of the bacteriophage. Um, new copies of the bacteria of the virus DNA, new copies of the uh, viral capsid, new copies of the viral enzymes, um, and things like that. So you can see the little viral DNA copies here, the little capsid copies and pieces and things there. Um, so the DNA is not gotten rid of yet, um, but now the DNA is gone. So what's going to happen um, is now the little virions are going to be put together. Um, you're going to start to assemble all the little pieces of the virus. They're going to have the capsids put together. The little lunar lander legs are going to be assembled. Um, you can see how here how this works. So the capsids put together, the DNA is put together on the inside of the capsid. 
all those little tail fibers are added, the sheath and all that stuff. All the little pieces of the baby uh, bacteriophage are put together. So once that's uh, done, um, you go through step five, maturation, where the uh, bacteriophages are fully assembled and completely uh, ready to go. Um, and then what's going to happen is the cell is going to be lysed. This is the concept of the water balloon. Um, if you're an envelope virus in humans, uh, in animal cells, you don't do this process. You bud out. But if you're a non-envelope virus, you don't have an envelope, you don't need to get a bud, you're just going to lyse the cell. So all bacteriophages will do this at some point in time. This is the um, just bacteriophages that we're talking about right here. So these guys will um, kind of overfill the cell. Um, the water balloon concept, too much water in the water balloon, the water balloon pops, the cell will pop, the bacteria cell will pop and die, um, and the little bacteriophages will be released it back into the environment, um, and they'll go infect a new cell. Start the process all over again. So this is the concept of the lytic cycle. Now every once in a while, bacteriophages, different species, can enter something called the lysogenic cycle. Now this occurs when a virus, a bacteriophage, infects a, a bacterial cell, but for whatever reason, it doesn't instantly start into the duplication stage. Um, it doesn't kill the host cell instantly. What it does is it will embed itself inside of the host DNA. So the viral DNA, you guys can see it here, becomes permanently embedded inside of the DNA of the original bacteria. Now when this occurs, um, the bacteria d does not become infected with the virus. The virus is not actively uh, making copies of itself. It's not causing problems yet. But now when this DNA replicates, this host cell replicates, it's going to make a copy of its own DNA as well as a copy of that viral DNA. So when this host cell DNA uh, host replicates, you're going to end up with two host cells which have a, co a copy of the virus inside of them. Those two replicate into four, which gives four uh, virally de uh, infected cells, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32, and then all of a sudden you have 5 million cells which all have copies of the little viral DNA inside of them. And then what can happen is the virus can reactivate and switch from this stage right to here. It's already inside the cell, it's already gotten here. It can go instantly from here to here. It can turn off its lysogenic state, its dormant state, and switch instantly to the duplication state so it can turn on at any time. Um, so it can be sleeping inside of the colonies of bacteria, chilling out, and then switch on and turn itself on at any time and enter the lytic cycle. So some species of bacteriophages can do it, but not all of them. So here's a comparison um, of animal viruses versus bacteriophages, some of the similarities and a little bit of the differences. Okay. So the classifications of viruses, um, you can check over this one if you'd like. Um, this is how viruses are put together and the steps that they have to take to get RNA, the genetic material on the inside. A uh, class 1 virus um, has double-stranded DNA on the inside. Very easy to make that double-stranded DNA into mRNA instantly. You need the mRNA to make proteins and make copies of yourself. Class 2 has single-stranded DNA. That single-stranded DNA then has to be transcribed to double-stranded DNA inside the host cell to make your mRNA. Class 3 has double-stranded RNA. Awesome, good to go, everything you need. Instantaneously into mRNA. Class 4 has positive sense RNA. you got to switch that around to negative sense to read it, and you're good to go. Class 5, same thing, negative single sense, you're good to go. And you guys can see here. Um, Single-stranded RNA with reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase will turn it into RNA um, or DNA. Turns that DNA back into RNA. Um, you can see the steps that are involved here. And then double-stranded DNA plus reverse transcriptase viruses, they already have that DNA there as well. So virioids. Um, virioids are infectious pieces of DNA that lack a protein coat. Or sorry, RNA, not DNA. Little infectious pieces of RNA. Um, that are found mostly in plants. These are very interesting little um, um, type of uh, infectious particle. Um, what they do is they cause the uh, plant cells to uh, lose the ability to produce very important uh, proteins and very important hormones for the plants to be able to grow. Now you can see here this particular plant has been impacted by a virioid, whereas this one hasn't. Same age plants, same uh, nutrients, just one of them has been severely stunted in its growth. You can see here, same with the fruits, 
Um, this one's significantly been impacted in its color by a virus. Um, and this type of plant has also once again been impacted by its growth just by having a virus inside of it. Now, another type of little infectious agent that's not considered living an acellular agent is called a prion. Now, prions are essentially uh, misfolded proteins. Um, it's a protein that, for whatever reason, is set up like it's supposed to be in its normal shape, like it's supposed to be fully functioning, doing its thing. Um, but then, for whatever reason, it breaks. It loses its normal structure. It becomes twisted, warped in an odd way, um, and then it becomes infectious. Um, that infectious protein will then travel, quit doing what it's supposed to do. If it's uh, supporting brain tissue or um, you know, aiding in uh, uh, supporting uh, neurons and things like that, it'll quit whatever it's doing, uh, move on to the next protein nearest it, um, and then make that uh, protein change its shape um, and then become an infectious prion as well. So one prion can make two prions, two prions make four, um, and then they self-propagate and make more prions from the rest of the, from the original one. Now we don't know where these come from. We don't know what causes them. They can randomly occur. Um, you literally, you could wake up with a prion one day in your brain. They're extremely rare. We do know that they, how, uh, however, are infectious. Um, they are found in mostly in animal species. I think they're only found in animal species. Um, and they're found uh, proteins that infect um, that are found in the brain tissue and nervous tissue of animals. Um, so if you eat brain tissue or nervous tissue of an infected animal um, or an infected human, um, you can potentially get those prions inside of your body. Um, these prions can um, survive, quote unquote, survive. They're not alive. They just don't become denatured. The process of cooking. Um, so they're not broken down. They're not destroyed. Um, so you can cook the meat properly, uh, um, and they can still cause infection sometimes. It's a very interesting little uh, type of infectious protein. Um, so one of the very common ones you guys may be familiar with is mad cow disease. Um, it originated in uh, bovine cows. Um, actually, um, or originated probably in sheep. Um, There's a disease called scrapies and got it from cows. Um, and what happened is, uh, cows got it from uh, it's a sheep anyway. And what happens is um, you would, f a long time ago in Europe in the 80s, not a long time ago, in the 80s, 1980s, 1990s, um, they would t feed cows um, protein and uh, derived from uh, other animals. Um, so instead of protein derived from uh, beans and soybeans and stuff like that in their diet, the protein that the c cows would be fed at the feedlots were derived from uh, uh, meat of other cows, uh, leftover meat scraps and things like that from the uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, so what uh, happened um, is they somehow got a piece of contaminated meat um, from the slaughterhouses um, from an organism that had an infectious prion. Um, got some of the brain tissue or the nervous tissue of that organism inside of the food supply. Now, once that occurred, um, that protein was then fed to other cows um, who got that infected tissue, that infected brain tissue in their diet. Um, they were then became infected with prions. They uh, then in turn got mad cow disease. Those cows were slaughtered, um, and then the process was repeated over and over again. Now, if humans eat that steak, uh, or anything uh, from that cow, we could potentially um, get that prion from them as well. Um, those prions do the same thing in us as they do in the cow. They take over our, uh, our other our proteins and cause them to quit doing what they're supposed to do. And now in uh, cows, it's called mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Spongiform, uh, it's the name, uh, spongiform, their brain looks like a sponge. It has lots of holes inside of it uh, from the proteins quitting do, uh, doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, in humans, it's called Kurtzfeld-Jakob's disease. Now, vaccines. Um, to, note, to date, there have been no drugs that have ever been developed that can outright just cure a viral infection. We can prevent them in the sense of uh, you can uh, train the body to fight against the virus from the get-go. You can block the uh, receptor sites, like I mentioned earlier, or you can destroy the virus when it's outside of the human cells. But once the virus is inside of the human cell, there's very little you can do about it. Because if you want to destroy the human cell, or if you want to destroy the virus, you have to destroy the host cell that it's inside, unfortunately. And to do that means that you cause damage to the host. And that's kind of the opposite of what treatment is supposed to do. Uh, but vaccines um, are one of the ways that humans have developed to uh, prevent um, um, viruses in the first place. Now, viruses and uh, vaccines, vaccines get their name 
um, from the very first type of vaccine, quote unquote, that was developed. A guy named Edward Jenner um, developed a vaccine um, for smallpox in the 17, uh, late 18, uh, late 17, early 1800s. Um, he derived it using a virus called uh, cowpox. Um, cowpox, uh, vaccin is the Latin word for cow. Um, vaccine, vaccin, that's where the name vaccines come from. Um, now, um, a couple of the issues surrounding vaccines are that vaccines contain mercury. They do contain mercury, um, but mercury comes in multiple different forms. You have elemental mercury and ethyl mercury. Elemental mercury is extremely dangerous. Ethyl mercury, your body can turn it into alcohol and you urinate it out. It's completely harmless. Ethyl mercury is found in vaccines and in um, not elemental mercury. Scientists aren't that dumb. Um, Ethyl mercury is found in vaccines that contain something called thermosil. Um, it's a preservative that's found in multi-use vaccines. Um, so if the doctor grabs the bottle off the shelf, puts the syringe on it, turns it upside down, and sucks it out, puts the bottle back up on the shelf, it contains thermosil. It allows it to be stable at room temperature. Um, if you are concerned about mercury for any reason whatsoever, or if you have patients that are concerned about mercury, there's no reason to be. Um, but they do make single-use vaccines. Um, versions of them that don't contain thermosil um, if you have a patient that is concerned about that. You could also inform them that there's more elemental mercury because of the practices of our uh, dumping our um, um, electronics in the ocean. There's more elemental mercury um, in a single can of Starkist tuna than there is in the an entire route of childhood vaccines. A um, couple of other things about vaccines is they cause autism. Um, that theory was, or not theory, that um, silly idea was brought about in the 1990s by a guy in England um, who was um, going to try to form a link between the MMR vaccine, children that had been vaccinated with the MMR, um, and those that had um, autism. Now, how he did this is he did a 2,000-child study on 2,000 children looking at those that had been vaccinated and those that hadn't. Um, and then what he did was he looked at those that grew up and had autism and those that didn't. And then when he ran the results, he came to find out that it was something like a 20% increase um, in those that had been vaccinated um, with those that developed autism and those that hadn't. So his conclusion was that vaccines cause, or the MMR vaccine, um, leads to a 20% increase in the likelihood of a, a child developing autism. Now... Come to find out, um, people around the world, other scientists, started looking at this guy's study and went, hmm, that seems kind of fishy. Can we see your results? Can we see your study, please? And he wouldn't give it to them. It seems kind of odd that if you uh, believe in your study, you wouldn't let people see your study. Um, it ended up in court. Um, he was sued. Um, he had to release his uh, medical study, his entire study. And come to find out, his 2,000-child study um, was conducted on about 20 children at his five-year-old child's birthday party without the consent of the kids. Um, so he faked his entire study. All of it was done on 20 kids. He faked the results. Um, he didn't get uh, consent from their parents. Um, he fudged the whole thing, made it all up. And his entire study was also funded by an anti-vaccine pro- uh, 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 anti-vaccine um, uh, vaccines cause autism group um, that had paid for his entire study. And so he faked the whole thing. Um, turns out that the uh, uh, British courts re uh, revoked his medical license. He was thrown in jail. Um, but that didn't make headlines. Um, that type of sensational news doesn't make headlines as much as vaccines cause autism. So there's more to that story that people tend to not know. Um, it's just the vaccines cause autism part of that tended to stick around. So vaccines um, have done tons of useful things for humanity over time. Um, whereas the uh, lack of vaccines led to thousands of people dying from very, very, very preventable um, illnesses. So how do vaccines work? It's essentially like um, training to fight Mike Tyson. You can either go out and fight Mike Tyson with absolutely no training whatsoever, and he's probably going to kill you. Or you can take one of two different forms of vaccines. There's something called a weakened or an attenuated form of a vaccine. That's the same word, weakened or attenuated or killed. Now essentially what they do here is they take the virus itself or a bacteria, whatever it is, um, and they're going to kind of uh, weaken it a little bit, take some of its infectious ability out. So take the virus and knock off about 80% of its ability to cause disease. So this is essentially Mike Tyson, and they're going to take Mike Tyson and tie one of his arms and one of his legs behind his back. So he's not going to be able to fight as well as he could um, really. So you might have a chance against him now. 
If we injected full-on HIV or full-on flu into the human body, you'd get really sick and you might die. We don't want to do that. But if we inject like 10% flu into your body, your immune system's going to be able to go, oh, I got this. Um, and it's going to be able to come up and it's going to be able to knock out Mike Tyson, figure out how to fight Mike Tyson and beat him up and uh, be prepared if Mike Tyson ever shows up. So you're either going to have a weak form of Mike Tyson with his arms tied behind his back or somebody's going to just kill Mike Tyson and to show you what he looks like. Um, and if you ever see him again, you'll know what to look for. Um, and that's how that works. So um, you're going to form antibodies and this is essentially what your body's going to use to remember what Mike Tyson's looks like. So these are the soldiers that fight against Mike Tyson. So you fight against a weak Mike Tyson, your body forms tons of soldiers. Your body's shown a dead Mike Tyson, it goes, oh, I still need to know what Mike Tyson looks like in case he shows up again, and you form tons of antibodies for that as well. And then what happens is those antibodies have no, nothing to do, there's no virus floating around, they just spend their time chilling in your body. And then what happens if the, you come in contact with that virus in nature again, Mike Tyson shows up at your front doorstep, you've got tons of soldiers ready to fight against him. So if he ever shows up, they're ready to go, they can kick his butt. They kill the little weak version of Mike Tyson, train themselves, get ready to go. This is training, getting ready to figure out how to go. And then if real Mike Tyson ever knocks at the door, your body is ready to go. It's already got the soldiers trained that know what to do that can kill him before there's any problems at all. And that's how vaccines work. Um, you make vaccines in a lab by growing them inside of cells. So you have to grow the virus um, up inside of a lab to get the DNA, to get the particles and stuff out of the virus that you need to make the vaccine. So what's going to happen is you have to have living cells to, uh, for viruses to reproduce. We talked about that earlier. They cannot reproduce by themselves. So you're going to have a big giant vat of um, yeast cells or human cells or uh, animal cells, depending on what the virus reproduces in, and you're going to introduce the virus to that. That virus is going to reproduce inside of all of those cells. Um, propagate, propagate, propagate. And you're going to grow up a ton of that virus inside of the cell. And then what's going to happen is you're going to purify away all of the virus particles away from all the cell junk. Um, once you've got the virus particles away, you're going to kill them. And this is where you weaken Mike Tyson. You turn Mike Tyson into Mike and Tyson. <laughs> and then the Mike part can be injected and the Tyson part's gotten rid of, and the Mike part is in, um, fixed with other chemicals, stabilizers, and things like that, um, things that make it safe to be injected in the body, things that make it safe to, uh, to put on the shelf for a little while so it doesn't break down and things like that. Um, and then your body knows what Ty Mike looks like, um, so if Mike Tyson ever shows up, it already knows how to fight the Mike part. Um, it's pretty much going to figure out how to fight the Tyson part pretty quickly, um, and your body's going to be uh, trained from this little shot to fight Mike Tyson um, through this process. So let's go ahead and finish this up with a little bit of our bacterial infections. Um, and go ahead and finish this one up. So Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacteriosis, this is commonly called cruise ship diarrhea. Um, very commonly spread around through contaminated foods, contaminated water. Um, this is the very stereotypical uh, food poisoning, abdominal pain, diarrhea, fever, feeling really bad kind of thing. Um, two to five days after you eat it um, or eat bad food, you're going to come and uh, start to show your symptoms, um, and it lasts about seven days after they show up. Route of infection can be fecal oral, or transmission through food, and things like that. Diagnostic test, you're going to just mostly be based off symptoms and things like that. Um, once again, there's not really much of a need for um, antibiotic treatment unless you're in small kids and things like that. Most adults um, can deal with fluid replacements. Um, it's not the most uncommon disease on the planet, um, and there is a vaccine for it. Stomach ulcers, Helicobacter pylori, gram-negative little rod. It's a very interesting little uh, bacteria up here. Um, it's got a little um, flagella on it, very strange little guy. Um, it can have no symptoms at all. Every person on the planet pretty much is going to carry Helicobacter pylori in their stomach, um, in the upper part of your stomach. But for some reason, um, we don't know really why, it can migrate to the lower part of the stomach, um, the pyloric region of the stomach, hence the name, um, and then it can start to cause uh, ulcers. This is an ulcer down here in the a couple of ulcers. You can see them in the wall of the intestines, um, and that's a bad thing where the uh, um, bacteria has burrowed inside of the intestinal wall, um, and then stomach acid and things can start eating away at it. Um, um, the diagnostic test on this is really cool. Um, 
This bacteria does not like stomach acid, so it produces a, a its own version of quote unquote pepsid um, to allow itself to survive within um, this environment called urea. Um, and they can actually test for urea on your breath, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, fairly easy treatment. Um, amoxicillin metronidazole, it'll knock it out. Um, very interesting little bacteria. And our last little one here, pneumococcal pneumonia, also known as uh, diplococcal pneumonia was the old name for this. Um, Prevnar 13 is the vaccine for this. You've probably seen the um, commercials for it. Get your Prevnar 13 vaccine. A very common um, disease of the elderly. Um, it's found a lot in um, uh, retirement homes, and retirement communities, and things like that, and assisted living communities. Um, and it's very, very dangerous for uh, elderly. It's spread by coughing, um, spread by sputum, and things like that, respiratory tract. Um, and this is in an x-ray of the lungs, and you can see the scar tissue and the damage that this infection has caused to this person's lungs. Lung lungs are supposed to be clear on an x-ray. You're not supposed to see all this white scarring and things inside of here. Um, very, very, very dangerous, and it has about a 5 to 7% death rate. Um, and it kills quite a lot of elderly people in the United States every year. So that's pretty much the end of this lecture, guys. If you have any questions at all, um, please feel free to reach out. Other than that, you guys have a good rest of the day.